We've been talking for a while now, and uh, I just want to talk uh, a bit about Vietnam and yeah. about your experiences in Vietnam because I'm really interested in, in I mean, what your life is like in Vietnam and what your thoughts are on on Vietnam and the Vietnamese political system. Oh, and yeah. Um, so, how long have you lived in Vietnam? Uh, altogether about six years now, if you add it all up. Hmm. So you do you have like a permanent residence or like a work visa? Uh, what's your situation there? I have like yearly visas. I do it all by the book. Um, a lot of people live here kind of like quasi legally, but I I'm on like on paper. Uh, I have like a, a visa, yearly visa that I have to renew. Um, mm. and uh, it's not that hard actually. It's actually very easy to legally immigrate to Vietnam. Um, uh, which is kind of ironic since I'm from the United States of America. But um, yeah, it's pretty easy to live here as a foreigner if you you know just follow all the little rules. There's not a lot of rules. Like you just pay you, basically the way you get a visa in the U S uh, if you're a U.S. citizen or if you're from a developed country for most countries, you just uh, pay a little stamping fee at the airport. Um, you get a visa letter and you're, and you can live here. So it's not that hard mm. really. That's incredible. Yeah. I know in, in, in most Asian countries, it's very difficult to actually become a citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, if you were not born there or you don't have parents from there. Uh, is it possible to become a citizen of Vietnam? Yes, and I'm considering it. I'm actually, I guess you could say at this point, I'm planning it. Um, but the the here's the here's the mm. way it works, and it it's it's amazing. So here's the process: you you pay like I think it's a twenty dollar fee. Um, you have to like kind of prove to them that you can find gainful employment, and it's not like a, it's 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 all kind of um, it's all kind of an interview process. Uh, and and from what mm. I understand, because I've talked to people who have become citizens here. It's not really that hard. The hardest part is, it's really the only barrier, is you have to speak Vietnamese at like an intermediate level. You have to basically speak mm. it well enough that you can have a conversation with the interviewer and get through that process. So like, as of right now, I, even though I've lived here for six years and I've studied Vietnamese for about six years, I still suck at it. Um, but I'm yeah. planning to start, like <laughs> I'm, I'm moving to Da Nang soon and I'm going to actually start going to a, a school like five times, five days a week and really starting to learn it. But That's if cool. I can become proficient yeah. in Vietnamese, it will be very easy for me to become a citizen, actually. Um, they don't have any kind mm. of, like, requirements beyond the fact that you speak Vietnamese and you don't have a criminal record, and, you know, that's basically mm. it. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I do hope to become a Vietnamese citizen eventually. I'm curious, how did you meet Luna? So, we, we met, like, <laughs> we met online, like, like, in a dating app, basically. Um, cool. And, uh, but, but, yeah, it's just kind of funny, because um, the first date, on our first date, um, we just talked about like she was reading a book uh, by Stephen Hawking and I was like, holy shit, you're a nerd. <laughs> and she was like, yeah. And then we <laughs> talked about like Star Trek and Harry Potter and, you know, just all the nerdy things. Um, and that's basically it. And then uh, uh, collectively together, we have watched every single episode of Star Trek. I'm very proud of that accomplishment. It's like over six, 760 <laughs> wait, wait, hours. Wait, 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 wait. Every, so you say Star Trek. Do you mean like every show? Every show. We've watched every episode of every show and every film. We are complete, complete completionists of Star That's Trek. That's incredible. Wow. We've so just what's been the best one? Three years. What's the best? Oh, the, the best episode is the one where Picard goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. This is it pretty all much of all of them? them. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I like the original series myself. I'm personally an original series. Hell person. yeah. Uh, Luna, I can't remember. She, I think she likes Deep Space Nine the most. I think. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think she likes Deep Space Nine the most. Perhaps it might be maybe Voyager, but I'm I think surprised Space none Nine. of you would say Next Generation. Because we like to the we like the Next popular. Generation, but honestly, the Next Generation. Uh, oh my gosh! Please don't get me started. I will. But but the Next Generation <laughs> is like uh, for me, and I think Luna might might share. Is it it doesn't have as much of the like long story arcs and character arcs. It's a lot more kind of right, episodic. Yeah, it's more episodic. Yeah. yeah, which I know the original series is like super episodic, but I just love the the triumvirate of. Uh, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. I just can't. Yeah. I, I don't know if we'll ever have that kind of like on-screen chemistry duplicated ever again. It was just like something about when those three are like together. It's just amazing mm. to me. And I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm just a fanboy of. Uh, and I know that like uh, William Shatner's kind of a shithead, and I know that. I know all that stuff. <laughs> Leonard Nimoy pretty was pretty cool. Um, but uh, anyway, the the yeah, I don't know. It's just a, the the characters are what really does it for me when it comes to Star Trek. So, um, and the movies the, that came out of the original cast are just incredible. Oh yeah. They're, they're the most like the, the, the original series movies are actually like watching an episode of Star Trek. Like they actually have really strong, like sci-fi 
philosophical yeah. themes, whereas the next generation movies, they're just kind of like action movies. Bad. I mean, yeah, I'm not super yeah. into those. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, sorry. I sorry. Yeah, I could. Entirely. I could literally. We could turn this into a Star Trek uh, podcast <laughs> if we're not careful. So. <laughs> next time you're on, it's all Star Trek. I'm. I'm on board. I'm 100 percent on board for that. <laughs> I mean, it's keeping with the with the like um with the theme. Uh, what are movies like in Vietnam? Which movies do you get? Are there a lot of locally produced movies in Vietnam, or do you get a lot of Chinese movies? Uh, I know you probably get a lot of American movies at like cinemas and stuff, right? Yeah, you know what's funny is that when I first came here, it seemed like when I went to the movie theater, it was like maybe eighty percent or seventy percent, um, like U.S. movies mostly, and then it would be like maybe fifteen or twenty percent Korean movies. Korean movies are like the the, the big thing in Asia right now, all over. Like Korean music, huh. K-pop, and Korean movies, and Korean TV shows. That's kind of like much more influential than U.S. media right now for a lot of people in Asia. Um, not just in Vietnam, but like also in China and you know all over the place. Um, Thailand, the Philippines, people watch a lot of the Korean like soap operas and stuff. Um, so when I first moved here, it was like maybe 60-70% U.S. and then like 10-15% Korean. And then the rest were like maybe Vietnamese movies and a few Chinese films or whatever. But lately for the last few years... The Vietnamese film industry has completely exploded. And now when I go to the movie theater, t- typically 50% or more of the movies will be Vietnamese movies. It's like they've wow. really kind of um, built their own like kind of film culture here. And it's amazing. And the movies are really good. There's a really good movie. Um, here, I'll look up the name of it while I'm talking. But uh, in Vietnamese, it's called. Uh... But anyway, um, she uh, it's, it's, it's an action movie. That stars a woman, and it's like her trying to get her kid back. Um, and uh, the, the the amazing thing about this film, I, I want to do a video on this eventually, is that um, it's like an action movie that has a female lead that is completely devoid of the male gaze. So like you, huh. this this character is never sexualized. Hai Phung. It's called Hai Phung in Vietnamese. So now I can probably find it on Google. Hai Phung. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but but it's like so amazing because it's like this strong yeah it, if you want to watch it it's on Netflix actually it's called Fury in English the English title is Fury F U R I E um, but you watch this movie it's like amazing because it's like and the thing about it is is Vietnam has a long history of strong women I mean like it was a matriarchal society before they got colonized by China um, they had like female gods there they had like queens there's a very famous um, pair of uh, women queens that some people say might have been lesbians there's a really strong theory behind that but um. They're called the Hai Ba Chung, the, the, the Chung sisters or the, you know, yeah. And um, they were like female warrior queens. Uh, and um, and of course, you know, we all know that in the Vietnam War, um, you know, women soldiers were critical and they had women generals and all that kind of thing. So it was really interesting to see that kind of play out in a film where you have an action movie and it's this woman and she's like fighting through the whole thing. You know, in an American movie, they, we have we have action movies that star women, but they're always like, you know, like heaving breasts and tight clothes and all that stuff like yeah. this woman is wearing a very like conservative drapey like like shirt the whole time there's even a scene where she falls into a river it's a, it's it, it, and, and she gets out of the river and you know you think it, i was just i'm like okay here comes the sex scene or you know like she'll be like sexy and dripping <laughs> and wet t-shirt kind of thing but it's like no there's like nothing sexual about it and i just it was just amazing to me because i've never seen an action movie with a female lead or with any female character <laughs> It's not like overtly sexualized. I just thought that was a fascinating little uh, side note. But yeah, but they have a lot of great uh, films, hmm. really great films. I just looked it up and apparently it's the highest grossing Vietnamese film in, in Vietnamese history. I wouldn't be surprised That's by cool. that. Yeah, yeah. It was a big deal here. Like they had all the, um, you know how they have the little like, don't use your phone in the theater things. Like that was a uh, Hai Phung, uh, like they produced it with that actress and she like rode into the theater on a motorbike and stuff. It was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. I will say, though, in defense of American cinema, they have really dialed down the hypersexuality of women in the last 10 years or so. I'm guessing also just uh, out of fear. Like, I think they really want to sexualize women, but I think I think they're, they kind of feel like they can't anymore yeah. because of backlash. But, yeah, you can yeah, notice. That. I mean, like, well, the, the, the um, I think a great like if you really want to see that, just look at the movie poster for the old uh, Tomb Raider movie and then look at the new Tomb Raider movie. Like, they've definitely oh, desexualized yeah. it a lot. But even then, like if you watch the new Tomb Raider movie, there's definitely like sexualization going on. Um, mm. So much, and the Charlie's Angels movie is, looks like such a mess. Too. Yeah, just everything sexualized. And yeah, yeah. but it's but watch this movie Fury. It's like it, you'll it'll blow your mind because like I watched the whole thing. It, I actually didn't realize it until like after we finished watching the movie, 
And I was like, what was so weird about that movie? And I was trying to figure it out. And I was like, holy shit, there was just like no sexualization. So then I watched it again and I was like, <laughs> oh my God, it's totally, there's not a frame in the movie where she sexualized it. I just thought that was so fascinating. That is fascinating. Yeah. And it, that's just such an ingrained part of watching a movie. Yeah. It's funny because it's, it, it's such a, like a low bar. Yes. <laughs> like, it's a, it's it really such a is. small thing to be impressed by. Like, wow, <laughs> this movie did not like turn the main character into a sex object. Yeah. Like, wow. Wow. This movie didn't kill any animals for the fun of it on set. Wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm, I, I guess this is the last thing I'll say about this, but there's one scene, um, and this is interesting too. There's one scene where it shows her past and she like used to be, I don't know if it's like kind of it's kind of coded that she was a prostitute. And so she's in this like kind of like bar with all these like girls and they're wearing and they're wearing like kind of sexy clothing. But it's very like sad. Mm. You know, it's like mm. it's like the, the the women are all very clearly being kind of like abused and they're not like like the clothes they're wearing are these kind of like cheap, you know, like kind of it's not really sexy. It's just kind of sad. It's like a depressing kind of sexuality, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um. And it And it doesn't it's not titillating at all. It's like. I feel really bad for these women that are in the situation and, and it's, it's shot that way, you know, like they never do like mm. the pan up or anything. It's just very like stark. This is what it's actually like to, to be like a, you know, essentially a, a, a victim of like the sex trade industry. Um, yeah. so it's, it's, it, I don't know. That, that was fascinating kind of a feminist, but it's not overtly feminist either. It's, it's a good movie. Good movie. Good flick. Yeah. Um, is it true that in, in Vietnam, the Vietnam War is called the American War? Yes. Yeah. Which is kind of um, awkward <laughs> for me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when I first came to visit here, I, I went to Saigon. I lived in Saigon originally, and I went to the what used to be called the American War Crimes Museum. And now they mm. call it like the War Relic Museum. Um, but uh, and that's the other thing is like it's really actually fair. Like it's a fair portrayal. Like they actually showed some like images of war crimes that the North committed. It wasn't like just a totally anti-American, you know, uh, propaganda kind of thing. It was like, this is the reality of the war. And of course there was plenty mm. of American war crimes to like put on display. There was no shortage of that, but it wasn't like a, just a total attack. And there was a huge, um, like one of the biggest exhibits was about Americans that were like protesting against the war. So they had like mm. photographs of mm. people that were protesting and they had like actual signs that people were holding up and like, a, yeah. a few pictures of Jane Fonda and that kind of thing. So it was like, it, it was pretty, um, they, they, there's no demonization of the United States of American people in Vietnam mm. ever. Yeah. And I, I thought when I first moved here, when I first visited here, I was terrified that they would be sort of, that they would hate me, you know, cause I, mm. you know, cause I come from this country that did inflicted so much harm on them. They draw, you know, the United States dropped more bombs on Vietnam than all of the combined countries of world war two dropped. Oh, you yeah. know, through the entire theater of war. So, um, it, and so I really thought like there's, there'd be a lot of animosity towards me, but I have not, I can tell you this. I have not once in all the years that I've been here, I have never felt like somebody had any kind of animosity towards me for being an American. Not so once. not even in the museum. Nope. Nobody sent you any dirty looks or anything. Not at all. No. I mean, and I've talked to, <laughs> I have since talked to, I have talked to victims of the war. I have talked to veterans of the war. You know, I've talked to people who were in the Viet Cong, uh, the, the Viet Minh actually is what you would actually call them in Vietnam. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to a woman who just real quick side story. Um, you know, this one old lady I talked to, she was a young girl during the war in like 1970. She was she lived in Hanoi and uh, she was walking down the street in the middle of Hanoi and she was with her best friend. And she she remembers like she saw a dog crossing the street. And that's the last thing she remembers and then like blacked out. And the next thing she knew a bomb had fallen like really close by. And she said that, you know, all of the blood and the gore in the street, she couldn't tell what was the dog and what was her best friend. Oh my, you know, and she tells oh, me wow. this story and I, and I, and I asked her like, aren't you angry at the United States of America or whatever? And she's like, well, no, I'm, I'm very angry at like, Richard Nixon and at like the, <laughs> the war machine of the United States of America. And I'm, you know, I'm angry at like the government that made this happen, but they understand mm. she knows she's not like a college educator or anything. This is a very working class person, but she knows that like the people, the, the, the kids who got drafted into that war didn't have any choice by and large. You know, most mm. of the, most of the soldiers that were, she said this to me, you know, she's like a yeah. 80 year old woman. She said this to me. Like, I know that most of the American soldiers that were there, they were drafted. They didn't want to be there. I know that a lot of American people opposed the war. 
she's not mad at the United States of American people. She's mad at the United States of American state. Mm. And it's really amazing to me that they make that distinction. Yeah. That's a lot more intelligent than most, uh, a lot of Swedish people at least, who, you know, equate being a Muslim with being an Islamic fundamentalist who wants to kill everyone and doesn't, like, just the concept of, like, if you've been drafted by the Islamic State or, or some other fundamentalist group and you didn't want to be there, but, you, you know, you were kind of forced to, mm -hmm. like, if that ever comes out, you're, I mean, you people will never accept you, even if you were, like, there involuntarily. I, yeah, yeah. It's definitely a, it's a double standard, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, and the United mm. States definitely has that double standard because we... For, for 20 years, and that's the other thing, when I was in school, I learned that the Vietnam War, as we call it in the U.S., started in 1965, but we were there in the 50s, in the early 50s. You know, we were actively supporting the French with American troops, um, and uh, yeah. for, so, yeah. for, for, so for 20 plus years, we were engaged in a terroristic war of oppression and, mm -hmm. and invasion, and, you know, but we don't blame... First of all, we don't even recognize that that's the case to begin with. But, you know, even the people that do, we don't blame the soldiers that got drafted. Mm. Uh, but of course, if, if some poor kid in, you know, Syria gets literally kidnapped and turned into like a child soldier, you know, then once they grow up, then they're forever in our minds a terrorist. And there's like no redemption mm. from that. It's uh, it's an otherization. It's it's a it's a major it's a, it's a because I think just to a great extent, we don't treat them as we don't think of them. I'm saying collectively, you know, like we in the developed world don't think of them as humans in the same way mm. that we think of other people from other developed nations. Have you mm. seen the Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam War by chance? I haven't yet. I, we really want to see it, but it's like um, everyone long. tells us it's pretty heavy. Well, I, yeah. I'm more worried about it just being like kind of depressing and it's like 12 hours long. So it's like we Even need to just pick a week yeah. that will be a, you know, predetermined sad week. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, but it's, it's you know really I mean? good, actually. I was very surprised. It, it goes into I've great detail in uh, how America was involved and France was involved way before it's been established that the Vietnamese War began. And it features all these incredible personal stories, like the one you just told uh, from Vietnamese mm -hmm. people from the North and from the South and like the American I, soldiers. I really want to see it because I heard that there are a lot of North Vietnamese people who have never been interviewed before. Oh, yeah, like army generals and stuff, and it's so good. Yeah, I yeah. really want to see that. Hmm. Vo Nguyen Zap, who is the, the great general of Vietnam and considered by many to be one of the greatest military minds in general in history, um, so his personal secretary is my dermatologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It's like, it's like the six degrees of Vo Nguyen Zap. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like in uh, Goodbye Lenin when the former uh, cosmonaut who moves out in space becomes a taxi driver. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and of oh, course, God. you know who else became a taxi driver is uh, Nestor Magno. He like lived out oh. his last days as a taxi driver in uh, in Paris, which I always thought was very sad. Oh yeah, uh, Goodbye right. Lenin's a great movie. Go to Paris. Yeah. I forgot about that. I need to rewatch Goodbye Lenin as a leftist. There's, it's funny when you become a leftist, like you have to go rewatch yeah. all these movies and like yeah. reassess. Goodbye Lenin is honestly probably my favorite like movie about communism or like the East. Ever. Mine too, actually. Yeah, I re I just rewatched it with my German girlfriend, yeah. and she thought it was hilarious too. <laughs> it was very funny. I I do remember that. It's great. I think it's such a good movie. It is no, and it's it's kind of a love letter to the whole nostalgia thing, where it's like the nostalgia for yeah. the East, but then also mixed in with this very drab reality of reunification. And you see, you see people in the East become increasingly disillusioned with the West. And all these ideals yeah. they had about how, oh, everything's going to be great now kind of evaporates as everyone's fired yeah. and like everything just turns to <laughs> just this nightmare of, of uh, like capitalist uh, requirements of, uh, yeah, and people are just drafted from the rest of Germany into the East to take their jobs. And yeah, it's pretty yeah, sad yeah. in a way. And I remember when I watched it, I was actually doing a shitload of wedding videos and there's the whole like plot about how the guy's doing these like, um, I think. I don't know if they were wedding videos. I think he did a yeah, like yeah, karaoke yeah, the guy, videos he, he, or something. On the side of uh, working as a satellite dish installer, he does terrible wedding videos. Or is like yeah, pretentiously I remember being like, in references like so, to 2001 and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I was so like, like, like uh, empathizing with him. I was just like, ah, yes, that yeah. is. What it's like. uh, so one of the questions that, that I really wanted to, to touch upon was how you as, a, as an anarcho-communist view the Vietnamese uh, political and democratic system mm. um, like 
so I don't really know anything about how the Vietnamese democratic system works. I assume it, it works similar to a lot of Marxist Leninist countries, how, you know, in, in the past and, and in the present work is, you know, based on uh, kind of local constituencies like neighborhoods uh, in public meetings selecting uh, candidates who then go on to run in like municipal elections and then from there they can go on to like regional and national elections and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And like the whole like political parties and, and like campaign promises and that kind of stuff is not really involved. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah, you're yeah. pretty much exi- like hit the nail on the head. It's, it's, it's basically the Soviet style and same thing they kind of do in China where it's like you have local elections and then whoever you vote in for your local representative, they vote together for like mm. this the whatever they would call a state you know or a province or whatever and then the, that mm. next level would vote the next so it's like a very it's like the textbook definition of a hierarchy so you know mm. by the time you get to the national assembly like only very top high level people are voting for national assembly me- members and then only the national assembly members can vote for the president so yeah i don't dig do, that do you have um <laughs> do you have mass organizations they have well, yeah. It's all kind of tied into the state. So, for instance, um, uh, they have it's 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 it is uh required for every company in Vietnam to have a union, um, mm-hmm. and the unions have to be affiliated with the state. But that's not to say that they're like state run. Um, they have autonomy in the sense that they can go on strike whenever they want. They can like create their own bylaws. Um, you know, they, they it it's it's not unlike in the I don't know about uh European unions, but in the USA. Every union has to be affiliated with the American Federation, not the American, the, uh, sorry, the, um, the Bureau of Labor, the United States Bureau of Labor, which is a government, it's like a state department and they have to follow the rules for like certain things about organization and how they collect dues and all that kind of thing. Um, Hmm. so they do that in, it's, it's really not that different really than the United States, except for the fact that every company is required to be unionized and they do have a lot of Hmm. strikes. They have strikes like pretty much every day they'll have some like small scale strikes. They've had major mass strikes. Uh, like I, I think a year or two ago, there was one of the biggest strikes in Asia ever was, uh, in Vietnam against a Taiwanese company. I can't remember the name of the company, but, um, they have, uh, uh so it might've been Fox. I'm not sure, but it was a big, like, mm. yeah, like a software company or something like that. They were, you know, or a hardware company they were oh, manufacturing. Okay. Um, so they have, Foxconn then, yeah. yeah, they have a lot of strikes. They have a lot of demonstrations. They have a lot of just like political demonstrations. Um, there like every there's student unions like every student has to be a member of a student union that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and you uh, have like a uh, like a women's federation. Yeah, there's a women's union. Yeah, yeah, and um, oh, okay. and and that's a that's actually a big deal. I mean, they they actually do have a lot of power there, and they've made yeah. a lot of uh, social progress. I mean, they're, they're, Vietnam is going through a Me Too movement right now, and Luna mm. uh, Luna of Luna Oi, who's my partner on the channel, wrote an article mm. last year about the Me Too movement in Vietnam. It's very fascinating the way it's happening. Um. But uh, yeah, they're they're going through this their their own uh, progressive movement. Uh, trans people are working. I, I interviewed a trans woman in Hanoi a couple of times. Her name's Hamin, um, and she talks a lot about how basically the government is trying to create trans rights in Vietnam. They're trying to create uh, the the problem is that they just don't have like like and this is the problem with bureaucracy and and this kind of hierarchical system is that like so she said they the what she said is that the government is actively trying to make it possible for trans people to get free reassignment surgeries but a barrier to that mm. is that they currently don't have any kind of bureaucratic mechanism to change somebody's gender on their id if that gives mm. you a sense of like yeah. some of the problems with the state apparatus <laughs> you know what i'm saying so it's like it's yeah. not that there's a like a resistance to trans people getting rights here it's that there's a lot of bureaucratic bullshit that has to be waded through the same thing kind of went down in Denmark because we have a, a very strange system of identifying people where the in our personal ID numbers, uh, women have uh, their numbers end in an equal number and uh, men's end in an uneven number. So it's yeah, uh, it's the same here actually. Yeah, yeah wow. but I think wow. they fixed it somehow. They just give you a new number. Yeah, you, you can change your your personal I, like if if you change your legal gender, your personal ID number also changes. Yeah, it does. Here. Yeah, now it does. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder what they would. I guess they'd have to come up with a. S- like something else for non-binary or something. I don't know. But I mean, but that, that's the thing is like, I want to I want to make this clear. Like the problems that Vietnam has are like the same kinds of problems that any developed country has, or, you know, like the United States has, I would say it's far, it's a far better system in Vietnam than we have in the United States. I know that's a very mm. low bar, you know, but, um, but <laughs> in a lot things of ways, work probably, better yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, mm. the, 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 the things here's, here's what I'd say. The problems with Vietnam, 
every problem they have here really is tied to capitalism. And mm. all the things that are getting mm. worse about Vietnam are tied to capitalism. And all the things that work really great in this country are socialist policies. I mean, the socialism that, that they have here works really, really well. They have price stabilization. Con- uh, so in, in the U.S., you would call this a price control, but here they call it price stabilization, which I think is a better name. They have the best price stabilizations in the world, I would argue. Um, like the, the mm. price of food and, um, and medicine and, and the things that they price stabilize here, uh, school supplies, housing to some extent. Um, it's like all that stuff is incredibly affordable, even for like the poorest workers. You know, I remember no... reading a thing about how there was a shortage of I can't believe I, I, I can't remember if it was meat or rice or something in uh, Asia. And it, it, it didn't really affect Vietnam at all. Because pork. Of, uh, yeah, it was pork. That, that was just a few oh, months yeah. ago. Yeah, like uh, we yeah, had to yeah, yeah. we had to read I it in the newspaper because yeah. uh, we, we didn't know like because there was a there was this big swine disease and it affected all of Asia and Vietnam was hit by it, too. So like like thousands and thousands of Vietnamese pigs were dying from this disease. But we didn't even know because the price stabilization is so good here that like we were going to the grocery store and buying pork at the same price as we always had. Whereas That's right incredible. next door in Cambodia and over in Thailand and in Laos and in China, pork prices was yeah. like skyrocketing. And we didn't even know until we saw it in the newspaper. So they, they do a really good job with that stuff. And Luna actually. I follow, um, um, oh, go ahead. I, I follow the, uh, the South China Morning Post on, mm-hmm. uh, on YouTube. And they published a, like a video that had like gone viral of like a bunch of grandmas in uh, in some rural town in China fighting over like the last piece of discounted pork. Yeah, uh, which had yeah. like gotten like millions of views in China. Gotta get uh, that pork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gotta get that pork. Yeah, it was like a giant piece of pork though. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> like, they could have cut cut it up and like shared it between them, but no, the, all those grandmas wanted the whole thing. Gotta Grandmas's. have that pork. I mean, grandma individualism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've got to make the the stew for the grandchildren. That's true. Like you have Sixteen grandkids. You That's know? right. Got a lot of mouths big. to feed. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it's like it's you never see like that kind of stuff in Vietnam. Um, Luna's doing a video right now, so if anybody's listening to this, it'll probably be out by the time you hear this. Um, that will kind of explain how the price stabilization in, in Vietnam works, and it's really really yeah. fascinating. So um, she can kind of fill in a lot of the gaps there. But the social, yeah, that, that's not the only thing. The um, the education here is incredibly cheap. So Luna's entire uh, college education was, I think, around it was less than a thousand dollars. I think it was like eight hundred dollars or something like that. Um, and that's because it's like you know she and she went to the best school, one of the best schools in Vietnam. It's the best business school in Vietnam, um, hmm. in Hanoi. You know, like a major college. It was like less than a thousand dollars for her, her entire four year. That's like all in. It was like less than a thousand dollars. She said, "I, does, I always does asked that her include um, oh, like uh, room and board and books as well." Yeah. Because I asked her, like, did wow. you ever apply for any scholarships? And she was like, eh, it wasn't really worth it because it's so cheap. She's just like, it wasn't <laughs> worth the time to apply for his scholarships. Um, and uh, mm. same goes for healthcare. I mean, um, you do have to have insurance here in Vietnam, but the, the state provides insurance to citizens. And so, like, Luna pays, I don't even remember, but it's like less than $100 a year for really good insurance. Um, I, I mm. don't even have insurance. I'm waiting for, like, I have this uh, insurance policy I just bought. It hasn't kicked in yet, so... Um, it'll kick in in a few months, but, um, basically, uh, even without insurance, I go, I'll go to like the nicest hospital in the city. And, uh, like I got like operation on my elbow, um, from a pretty bad infection I had and it, the whole operation and everything and x-rays and everything, it was like $90. So oh, that was without, man. that was without insurance. Um, That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I can't even imagine healthcare that cheap. That's oh amazing. yeah. I mean, I got, I got, a. uh, uh Fillings in my teeth, you know, fillings in your teeth cost like 10 or 15 bucks a piece. That's without insurance again. Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. I tell people all the time, like, cause I, I see, sometimes I see comrades on Twitter who are like, like, uh, desperately in pain and suffering because they can't afford to get dental work. And I'm like, cause it would cost them like four or five, six thousand dollars to get some kind of like root canal and all this stuff. Yeah, and I, yeah. and I tell them like, you can fly to Vietnam, get the work done and then take like a vacation for a week and you'll spend like less than half as much. As you would That's just incredible. getting the procedure done in the U.S. I, I heard this statistic, uh, or like this, it's almost like a joke, but it, like the, mathematically, in, if you broke your hip, mm-hmm. uh, you could replace it in the United States, or you could uh, book a flight to Spain, uh, get your hip replaced in Spain, um, go live in Madrid for like, um, I think it was four weeks, Get trampled by bulls, get your hip replaced again, and then fly back to the U.S. for the same price. 
That wouldn't surprise me. It's it's a nightmare. The U.S. is a nightmare. I mean, it's so bad. Um, but Vietnam doesn't have those problems. I mean, there are certain things that are expensive. So, like, for instance, I, I do know from, like, researching my insurance policy, if I got cancer, like, you know, like some kind of fairly bad cancer here, um, that could cost, like, $20,000 if you don't have insurance. Um, but, I mean, that's versus in the U.S. where it would be, like, a quarter of a million dollars for the same yeah. kind of procedure. Because I looked, I compared. I mean, like, know, I, I want to... I wanted to say too, like I, I had a wisdom tooth pulled out and I still paid like a thousand dollars in Denmark. So that's, that's yeah. incredible that you can. And y'all have that yeah. Scandinavian mm. socialism stuff going on there. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, we're communists and stuff and we still have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Nordic uh, welfare. Right, socialism. right, right. So it's like, yeah, I mean, Vietnam is far from perfect. Now the problems with Vietnam are the fact that capitalism is actually growing here. Right. So like, yeah, um, I was going to, I was going to ask, do you feel uh, is Vietnam moving toward the left or toward the right? It's really hard to say. It's like, I'd say they're kind of like moving dead center, you know? It's like they're growing in both directions because they are mm. improving things like their public transportation system is getting way better. They're about to open a metro line in Hanoi, which is just so amazing to me. Um, I think the one in Saigon will follow shortly after. They're they're working, they're starting to lay the ground for a high-speed rail system. Uh, they're trying mm. to improve things like their public health care system. They're, 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 actively and i believe diligently and sincerely working on improving social safety nets and social programs right but simultaneously like you definitely have like these big corporations building huge property developments and all that kind of thing now property is really interesting in vietnam because it's against the law for a foreigner to own land in vietnam period mm. there's no foreigner in vietnam who owns any land uh, and that includes foreign companies as well. Like if it's a, if it's a majority for foreign owned company, they cannot own land. What they can do is they can lease land for like 99 years, uh -huh. but only a Vietnamese citizen okay. or a Vietnamese company can actually own land. Right. That mm, has yeah. really helped them a lot with staving off imperialism. Right. So the mm. way it works is like, if you get, no, it's not even a 99 year, I think it's a 50 year lease. So there's no way for like China, like, you know, how China's buying up land all over the world. And that's like a form of financial warfare. Yeah. Um, they can't do that in Vietnam. The best they can do is a 50 year lease. And then the government takes it over um, or has the option to they have the option to like release it or the option can just take it or the government can either release it back or they can take it back um, after that 50 year lease. So it's like basically I, the best you can do is like a condo in uh, in Vietnam yeah, if I you're think, a foreigner. Um, uh, Cuba has a very similar system where I think instead of leasing, what Cuba usually does is they do mixed ownership. Mm -hmm. So that a, a foreign company which wants to have land in Cuba, um, they can sell half of their company to the Cuban government. Mm -hmm. Like um, uh, there was uh, like a hotel chain in, in Spain or something. They wanted to build like a hotel in, in uh, Havana. And basically the Cuban government owns half of the hotel and get half, half of the profit from the hotel. And that was like the deal that they got like in order to be allowed to build anything. Or like own any land in Cuba, like half of it has to be owned by the government. I wonder what their uh, the rake on the cut on uh, Guantanamo Bay is. <laughs> oh, nothing. I know. I'm. I'm I was. That was a bad joke. Um, <laughs> no, I mean that's yeah. that's actually if if anything a better a better system than Vietnam has because uh, I believe that you what a lot of companies do in Vietnam is they'll um, like what a lot of foreign I know that Korean companies do this a lot because I used to have a lot of Korean clients when I was doing marketing here. Um, they'll own like forty nine percent of a business. And then that business mm. can buy land. And so they'll just have like a Vietnamese business partner that owns 51%. That's a really, really common thing yeah, you see. Yeah I, was, I was, yeah, I was thinking that actually. You could just like pay a Vietnamese person to like buy land for you. Yeah, that's what they do. But then of course there's always like, uh, I mean, the, the, yeah, the, the, that that's it, it still protects Vietnam from, you know, there's no way that that Korean company or any other kind of foreign company could go in and like take the land, you know, like they can't just mm. unilaterally seize the land. Um, so I think it's... Uh, yeah reasonably it, it works reasonably well to stave off imperialism to some extent now but there's still a lot of imperialism and the way of life here is changing i think that's the worst sign that i see of capitalism in vietnam is that i've seen it happen since i moved here i moved here in 2013 and since then i've seen a lot of lifestyle changes for vietnamese people like when i first moved here consumerism and stuff oh yeah consumerism for one thing uh, for sure but then also just like the mm. work life so when I first moved here, like it was a very like laid back kind of place and people valued their family and their friendships a lot more than like their business concerns. Whereas and in the in the the heaviest imperialism currently in uh, Vietnam is coming from Japan and Korea and to a lesser extent, China. 
but like the mm. Japanese and mm. Korean uh, work life is, and I can tell you this from working in Korea for a couple of years, um, they're like, like workaholics, you know, they work in, in Korea. People are expected to work like 50, 60 hours per week. And it's like, if you're not yeah. early, you're late, that kind of shit that's starting to bleed over and infect into the Vietnamese work life a lot. Um, we're starting mm. to see a lot more of like capitalism and work worship and that sort of thing in Vietnam. It's more of a, at this point, I would say more of like a cultural social problem and the fact that people are like not enjoying their lives as much. I mean, the thing about it is, is in it, and you see this, like this happened in Korea. I know like as companies tend to develop under capitalist conditions, uh, yes, people materially become more wealthy, but they also become less happy. And so you're seeing mm. Vietnam, which has always been ranked pretty high on the world happy index, like very high. Um, they're starting to drop and I, and I attribute that to capitalism. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's what really concerns me is the fact that you are, and it's not just foreign companies either. Like there's the, one of the biggest companies in Southeast Asia is called Vin Group. It's a 100% owned by one person who's like a multi-billionaire. Um, and he's got this like empire now where they make, they manufacture cars, they manufacture motorbikes, they have convenience stores, they have property development. They are going out and imperializing uh, like Cambodia and like there are Vietnamese telecom companies that are imperializing Africa and Myanmar. I mean, so like it's kind of really weird how this like the capitalist entities in Vietnam are now going out and becoming capitalist imperialists in even poorer countries, you know, as Vietnam is developing. Um, that's kind of a terrifying thing. Like when I was in, I was in Myanmar doing a job for uh, about a month and there were a lot of Vietnamese developments happening, you know, with like Vietnamese corporations coming in and basically imperializing Myanmar. And that's just kind of like, really rubs me the wrong way you know um so it's like i don't know i I would say that vietnam is at a crossroads right now and they're gonna have to decide and i and i feel like and i have to i I hope i really hope deeply and my 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 sense is that they will well i have okay do you want to hear my my uh conspiracy theory my moonshot conspiracy stories okay we love conspiracy theories so like the rumors are, and I believe these rumors are that, um, cause I've talked to people who work in Vin group and a lot of those people say that Vin group actually doesn't want to grow as quickly as it is. And that the government, the state is like forcing them to take out these big loans and invest and grow really fast. And my pet conspiracy theory that my heart believes what my mind does not is that the plan is for Vin group to get huge and like take over all of Vietnam. And then the state will just like nationalize it. And then they'll just have full communism. Hmm. <laughs> but i don't think Corporate that's actually going to happen i mean i don't uh, the, the chances of that actually happening are very slim but it's like my dream mm. i guess you know my my pipe dream that that will happen i really want to see a sitcom with this one vietnamese guy that buys property for rich chinese people like meet <laughs> yeah, dan <right. laughs> <laughs> he's got it all good. figured out with the chinese with the rich chinese people but he can't work out his love life like i really want to see that <laughs> You and me both. <laughs> There's a lot of potential for comedy in Vietnam, actually. It's, it's a little... So, so when I first moved to Vietnam, um, my, my, since my business collapsed and, you know, with my business partner uh, sort of going off the deep end or whatever, um, I ended up... What I did a lot of was freelancing. And I speak a little Korean. Um, I'm like an intermedi- intermediate Korean speaker. So I had a lot of Korean clients. Uh, that was kind of like my niche. and um, Or my niche. I, people always get on me how I say that word. Mm. Um, my niche was... Uh, <laughs> working with Koreans and helping them with like business consulting and marketing and all that kind of stuff. And they were like constantly stressing out because they were, um, they wanted the Vietnamese employees to work like they were used to the people working in Korea and they wouldn't do it. They would like not, they would just refuse to work on weekends or they would refuse to work overtime without pay and all that kind of stuff. And the Korean people were just like, like pulling their hair out, trying to get them to like basically be self exploit more or whatever. Um, and, uh, And at the time, you know, that was was like 2013, 2014. But I think I've I've noticed, uh, you know, in my personal observation over time, they've been worn down by these foreign companies. And you're starting to see a lot more Mm. of that, like work worship and capitalistic, individualistic mindset and people like, you know, submitting themselves to, you know, much deeper exploitation. And you're seeing it a lot even more with like Vietnamese companies now where a lot of these Vietnamese like this new generation of Vietnamese entrepreneurs are starting to be like sh- much shittier bosses than they used to be. And it's, and I'm not just saying this myself. I, I, I get this from talking to Vietnamese people, talking to Luna, Luna's friends, the people that I meet out in the street. Um, 
you know, it's getting worse and people are getting more unhappy here, especially in the big cities. You know, people are, are, uh, you just don't see as much of like it used to be if you go out for a walk in the afternoon in Saigon or Hanoi, you would see hundreds of, of people like sitting outside drinking tea, relaxing in the afternoon, yeah. you know, taking it because it's, you know, it's taking a little break, drink some tea. And you just don't see that as much anymore. And you don't see the, the, the relaxation like you used to. People used to value that kind of relaxation. And I think that's like human. I think it's it, we need that to mm -hmm. be healthy and happy and. And they don't really do it as much anymore. And now, now I talk to people and they're like, you know, uh, you know, we have the same kind of like video game development grindhouses that, you know, you hear about in the United States where, you know, people are having to work mm. extra hours, not getting paid crunch time. Software developers get a lot of crunch time here. It's starting to really get that kind of uh, yeah. developed country I mean, video, kind of video mindset. Video games is, is interesting because like video games have gotten so much bigger mm. and like the technologies in video games have gotten so crazy and, yeah. and like the like the development time that's required to go into to creating modern video games is, is incredibly high like you need a lot of people working many hours in order to create like red dead redemption 2 and like the really big triple a games yeah but they all still cost 60 dollars like they did 30 years ago right right like video games like the price of video games haven't changed the price of the dollar has changed mm -hmm. the video games have remained the same price which is why a lot of these video game companies have to pay their workers less and provide fewer benefits because otherwise there would just be no profit in making video games because people consumers aren't willing to pay more than 60 bucks for a video game even if it took like 10 years to develop yeah 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 i mean it's a it's a terrible uh business model like just just across the board it's a terrible business model it's a, yeah. it's it's um i would say it's an unsustainable i mean i i often wonder if we're not heading towards some kind of bubble especially if yeah if um probably yeah. the you know if the, if they keep mistreating the workers the way that they have been i mean i can't see that being sustainable people are burning out yeah. and they're and they're desperate you know um it's like the new sweatshop really in a lot of ways i mean since a lot of the sweatshops are starting to close down due to automation we're starting to see these more like like techie kind of uh sweatshops and it's just um you can't you can only you can only push people so far uh i i believe mm -hmm. um and uh yeah I, I do i do agree i do think that something's gonna give at some point yeah it's got and to when that happens like god knows what's gonna happen to the video game industry oh my gosh the gamers are gonna be pissed you know <laughs> <laughs> gamers gamers have to have to rise up gamers have um, to rise up and they, they need yeah. to realize that the things that they need to rise up about are not like like lesbian video game characters but you know the fact that <laughs> the people who make the games they love are being tortured you know and i'm not really i don't think i'm misusing that term i think telling somebody they have a crunch time where they're gonna have to work six days straight without sleeping as we often hear stories like that <laughs> is that's a form of torture yeah. you know i mean like come, come on and oh it, yeah yeah have some respect for the people that make the things that you love you know like like value those people and support them uh if, if you're a gamer and I play video games myself. Um, you know, if you're a gamer, then um, you should value the the work and the and the happiness and the and the work yeah. conditions of the people who are making the stuff that you love doing every day. You know, it seems seems so you know, obvious. Support um, support indie developers. Oh yeah, and like artists and and like make their own video games and stuff. Like um, uh, Temi uh, Toyoki, who worked on Undertale, uh, is now working on on a game of her own and like toby fox he, he's like a giant now but he's like still indie like he doesn't have his own company or anything like support those people yeah they need help or dong win <laughs> dong win the uh the creator of flappy bird who lives here in hanoi uh oh yeah <laughs> who i think might That's be a comrade perhaps I, I don't know if you've ever heard the story about this but like the the creator of flappy bird um did not expect it to get so huge and um, yeah, he took it down. Was very uncomfortable with it. Yeah, like like it was. Yeah. It's pretty funny that that whole story. But yeah, he 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 lives in Hanoi. I think that's pretty funny. Um, that's cool. Wish more creators were like that. Had some ethics and some. Uh, I mean, and in terms of like yeah. the actual owners of the properties, yeah. Um, but but I think the cooperative business model will probably start to really grow and take root in the video game dev world because we've already so, seen yeah. some early like success stories. And I think that a lot of developers will just naturally see those success stories and they'll say, what's stopping? Like, they'll look around at their coworkers and they'll say, what's stopping us from doing that? You know, yeah. like the, the five of us could make an awesome video game. And I think we're going to see more co-ops coming out of this. And I hope to see more unions as well. I mean, that's that's got to happen. We've got to yeah. get unionization. Video game unions and stuff. But I th like, I think 
like a lot of, uh, I think especially PC gamers, who like a lot of PC gamers love indie games uh, and 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 get indie games not necessarily because they're like oh I want to support the little guy but be- but because people who create indie games aren't restricted creatively oh, yeah. by like fucking EA or whatever like Tell they me about they it. are free to make whatever that they want what the, like their creative vision is and I think like a cooperative would also be very free to be able to you know make good products that are like art and not just fucking call of duty shooter or whatever that's at least pumped up for the sake of making money yeah absolutely absolutely and and that's the thing is like and this is what i really hope that like we can communicate to people is that under socialism that's what everything will be like everything will be more creative and more and, and made with more love and made with more passion and everybody be will more be unique yes like, more... exactly well, there'll be more, more diversity. Break, like, um, like if you've seen Peter, the movies of the Soviet Union, they were incredible. Yeah, yeah I right. was just gonna say, like, Peter, you often talk about like uh, the the movie techniques and stuff made up in the Soviet yeah, Union. Yeah, like they were pioneers, like, and all the stuff that we praise yeah. people like uh, um, Kubrick for doing and uh, Scorsese and stuff. It's heavily influenced by the art forms and the the, the experimentation of the Soviet Union, like Tarkovsky is one of the most mm-hmm. visually referenced movie directors of all time by everyone from Fincher to um to uh uh Kubrick. I mean, it's incredible how much if you if if you don't have that capitalist meddling to include like brands and uh like uh, certain themes and like uh a certain type of music and like everything is so detailed managed in Hollywood in a way that it simply wasn't in in the Soviet Union, like George Lucas proudly said and stands by to this day that he wishes he could have made Star Wars in the Soviet Union because he could have made a movie that was way more representative of what he wanted to make, but simply couldn't because of the capitalist yeah. system he was working within. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I heard something that I, th- I th- it might have been a rumor, but I uh, like that that um, there was a quote that like Star Wars w- was made to like represent the Vietnam War. Where the rebels were the Viet Cong. Yeah. And the yeah. Oh yeah. He's, he's said as much in interviews. Yeah. That it's it's a uh, it's a oh, Vietnam okay. allegory in its essence. Yeah. I mean that's 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 pretty. It's once you like learn that and you watch the movies again, it's so clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. But I remember watching um when I was in because I, I did study film when I was in college and uh I remember one of my professors showed us um uh Battleship Potemkin oh, and then I love like that movie. and then like showed us uh maybe four or five other films that were made in like Hollywood at in 1925. <laughs> Yeah. You know, the same year that that came out. And it was just like watching like uh, children, like a high school play and then yes. watching like a Broadway play. It's like Potemkin was like <laughs> so many leagues above what Hollywood was doing in 1925 in terms of the technical stuff and yeah. the acting and everything. It was just so amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, so Eisenstein was like. Eisenstein was completely... and still is one of the best directors of all time. Yeah. So, and like, it, was, it was like really. the si- it was a silent movie, you know, it's like. It's just amazing when you see it. Also, have you ever seen the Soviet? You could just Google it, like Soviet arcades. They had these like really awesome. They yeah. they were mechanical, so they had these like mechanical games. You know, like like so, mm. so the U.S. was kind of like fascinated with like the the video game with like a TV screen, but in the Soviet Union mm. they had these amazing arcades, but they were all like mechanical games. So they were like you would actually be like physically manipulating things. You know, it was kind of like pinball on steroids. So you'd have a shooting game where you'd actually be like shooting things with a real gun or like a submarine yeah. game where you'd actually be like having these little physical submarines moving around. It was really cool stuff. And I always wonder if the Soviets won the Cold War, like video games would look so different because instead of having it all on your computer, yeah. you would have we would probably have these like fucking crazy, like, like in like physically built environments. We'd all be like walking around. <laughs> I can't even imagine what it would be like if that just kept kept advancing. But American, would we have virtual reality porn? <laughs> we would probably have sex robots. I guess that would be the logical conclusion, right? Like, I guess we would have sex robots in, in the in the Soviet Union of like 2020. Right? I mean, if I, the East uh, made porn illegal. So I don't know if if that would happen, but uh, I'm sure they would have legalized it at some point. Like, let's be honest. You can you can legalize robot porn. Maybe. Come on. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. It's a victimless it's not crime. Exploiting anyone. <laughs> victimless crime. Just metal against metal. Prostitution <laughs> might not be a victimless crime, but robot prostitution. I'm just saying. But what about the robot pimps? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about the robot pimps. And that's <laughs> They're brutal, man. Robot pimps. <laughs> 
we're all canceled now. This is our yes. cancelization. Cancellation. I mean, in in Welcome twenty years, Island. when robots get rights, uh, and then we elect the first robot president of the United States, we will all be canceled. Oh my god! You got to remember to delete all archives of this recording when the robots take over. Yes. I mean, I don't want to mess with the robot tribunals. Elect me, yeah. uh, Senator yeah. Megatron Five Thousand. I will eliminate Mexican robots. <laughs> Uh, I can't wait to when impeach Mexico Cybertrum. When Mexico produces their robots, they're not producing their best. <laughs> they're producing raper bots Jesus and criminal Christ. bots. That's so bad. <laughs> we have to build a robot wall. Firewall. A firewall. <laughs> they call it the firewall. I get it. I get it. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there was another thing I wanted to say about Vietnam. Two things, actually. Yeah. Uh, that are just like fun tidbits about Vietnam. Which, um, the, well, the first one is, is, is a lot more fun than the second one. The, so the first one is that there's a, there's a Finnish song, a children's song, mm -hmm. called um, Lenin Seta Asu Veniella, mm -hmm. which I think translates to like, um, Uncle Lenin Visits Vietnam. <laughs> I don't speak Finnish, I'm very sorry. Mm -hmm. But it's a, so it's, it's a song recorded in 1972 by this uh, Finnish, Marx Finnish Marxist-Leninist uh, music, music, music group. And they said, like it said that they took the lyrics from a Vietnamese poem. Mm -hmm. um, and I was on a hunt for this poem. He really has been. For... He's talked about this for a while. So this is real. Yeah. Um, and, and I found it, uh -huh. actually. You did? Yeah. It's a poem written by Nien Hong Tien uh, on a, and it, it's, <laughs> so uh, a, a friend of mine on, on my Discord server found it on a, a blog spot blog. Wow. Uh, just written by some guy mm -hmm. who knew the poem from when he was a child. Wow. Um, so, uh, but yeah, but it's all in Vietnamese. I can't read any of it. We could get Luna to translate that for you, actually. She'd be that would be awesome. Okay, incoming Luna. Luna is incoming. We have a question for you about Finland and Vietnam. Oh, hey, Luna. Hey. Big fans of yours. We love your content. Oh, really? Hello. Hello. We have a question Hello. for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's this, uh, there's this song, this Finnish song that I've listened to for years. It was written in 1972. Mm. It's called Lenin Seta Asu Veniella. And it was, a, it was adapted into a song... Um, from a Vietnamese poem mm. written by a guy named Nguyen Hong Kien, who I don't know when he wrote it, written but it's um, I sent you the I sent a link on on Google Hangouts to the oh, okay. blog. Oh, I'll it. check that. Mm. Ong Lenin. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Oh, yeah, Ong Lenin ở nước Nga mà em lại thấy rất là Việt Nam. Oh, oh my God. This is the poem that we study in primary school in the moral, I don't know, I guess that in the, mor in the moral subject class. They have oh, a moral, moral subject class so and they have to study yes, this poem. Yes, 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 yes. It sounds so familiar to me. The so in Finland, they made a song out of this poem that you uh -huh. hear with. That's interesting, huh? <laughs> do you, do you, is it, is it something that you know by heart or? Yeah, this is something that I know by heart. Oh, wow. Yes, really? yes. Can you do a little brief, like, can you read the first couple of lines just so we can hear it in the so, actual Vietnamese? So, yes, actually, the original version, Vietnamese version of the poetry. Ông Lenin ở nước Nga, mà em lại thấy rất là Việt Nam. Cũng cũng vầng chán rộng thanh thang, y như chán bác mênh mông đất trời. Whoa. Yes, it's exactly the song that I knew. Oh, Luna, you're gonna have to make the official translation to English, I guess. I think this is like a, a new project for you. <laughs> yeah, this is. I I can translate to you like right now. It's so kind of very simple. Okay. Like Mr. Lenin from Russia, but I can feel like it's just like Vietnam, and it's like he 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 also has the same big forehead, <laughs> just like. The big forehead of Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> <laughs> that's so adorable. Oh, that's amazing. So, wow, we've we've really uncovered some amazing stuff here. I think this is really cool. We've got like a Finnish yeah. Vietnamese 
comrade connection going on. American, you know what we yeah. have to do now. We have to start a band. We have to sing this song in, in, in Vietnamese. In the, we have yeah. to like, yeah. top the charts. Translate it into English. Mm. Luna's an excellent vocalist. Can you sing the song to that to, in Vietnamese to the tune that you just heard? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not gonna try it. I'm not gonna try it. GG, <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard because we are tongue we are tonal language. So uh-huh. It's yeah. really yeah. hard. We'll give Luna some rehearsal time. Yeah, yeah. That'll be for the yeah, next yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Get you can get back to us. I'll that. play the git fiddle. Asher, you'll take the drums. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an accordion actually. That's a nice communist instrument. Hell so. yeah. Oh, this is gonna yeah, be great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've also got a kazoo. We can so. tour, tour Asia. Yeah, <laughs> go to Cambodia. Well, I play just, on on the streets. Yeah, I thought that I thought that'd be interesting to see. I, I'm I'm really glad to hear that you've heard of that before, Luna. I'm glad that uh, this was a successful yeah. mm-hmm. venture. So this I, is in the official textbook. Okay, official textbook of Vietnamese kids. Yeah, your your yeah. official indoctrination <laughs> manual. Yeah. <laughs> It's a very nice song, actually. <laughs> I know it's so sweet. I mean, like this it was a big forehead legitimately game. relaxing to big me. Big forehead game. Well, that's the thing too is that like in in Vietnam, you know they they have deep respect for Ho Chi Minh, but they also you know can kind like of, make fun like, of his big forehead. Yeah, nicely not, make fun mm-hmm. of him. It's not like a terrifying thing where like. And can I just say, in the documentary, the Ken Burns documentary we talked about, he is presented very respectfully. I think Ho Chi Minh. I gained a lot of respect oh, for that's him good. as a person from that documentary. I didn't know a lot about him before I watched the documentary, and I, I've looked yeah. into him afterwards. Oh. I think they actually did a very good job of portraying him as this father of his country and someone who really wanted independence for Vietnam. And yeah. yeah. Oh, he's... oh, yeah. I mean, even before the war, he spent yeah. his entire life fighting for independence. I mean, he was in prison when yeah. he was a teenager. Mm. It's, mm. it's quite amazing. So I was kind of, yeah, I was kind of very satisfied. When I asked the uh, American about how the historical textbook in America described Ho Chi Minh, mm-hmm. and he told me that there's nothing bad. Yeah, so they like, can't say anything bad about mm, it, really. Good, it's at funny. least. Because you read about like the Russian communists, and they're like, well, they're evil, and here's all this bad shit. And then like North Korea, they're evil, and here's all this bad shit. And then you get to uh, Cuba and Fidel Castro, and ah, he's, he's evil. And then you get to Vietnam, and it's like, well, Ho Chi Minh, is, he's trying to help yeah. his country. <laughs> <laughs> didn't really do anything bad. You know about the, uh, the, the, have you ever heard about the communist fraternal kiss? Yes. Mm-hmm. Did What's they that? do the, the fraternal kiss in Vietnam? I don't know. Because I know they didn't do it in China. I don't know if they do, like, normally or whatever, or, they, or if they still do. But, Luna, your uncle gave me, I think, a communist fraternal kiss. So, fraternal means, like, between brothers, right? Oh. So there's this yeah. old tradition yeah. in like the Soviet Union and stuff where like men would kiss each other, mm. right? Like when they greeted each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and like one of your uncles was, it, it was one of the guys who was wearing a uniform. I don't know if he was a policeman or a military oh. man or whatever. It was an old, old guy. Oh. And he, he kissed me on the cheek. Oh, really? Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the man who like the leader of my family or something? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. used to be a soldier. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Is that something that happens in Vietnam mm. a lot? Where like I guess I didn't know about that. It's like an old communist tradition. Mm. It goes back a long time. So Yeah. I, because I, I know that like in Eastern Europe between the communist nations, like in there's the the very famous photograph of Leonid Brezhnev yes. and Eric Conacher, who like are deeply embraced in in a, in a socialist fraternity kiss. Yeah. Um. But when the Soviet statesmen or any, well any politicians from the the Eastern Bloc would go to China, um, um even like before the Sino-Soviet split, when when they were still like comrades. Mm-hmm. Um, the Soviets, the Russians wanted to to do the socialist fraternity kiss with the with the Chinese, but they like in their culture that's very like they were very like no 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 that's not gonna fly yeah and so I think they came to like the um, after like mo- weeks or months of like serious political discussion like sitting down in meetings about this <laughs> oh my God. they were like the Chinese were like okay we will agree that the Russians can hu- we can hug. <laughs> uh, we can embrace in a deep hug, and then the Russians can kiss us on the cheek, provided that we do not have to kiss them back. <laughs> I wish the Soviet had been like, nah, I gotta have those lips. So that's the best they can do, huh? <laughs> that's the best. That and, must be... Like, I would, you to can be a, kiss me, all right, but I am not gonna kiss you back. <laughs> uh, I would love to be yeah. a fly on the wall during those yeah. negotiations. Holy shit. Could you imagine? That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, 
The, I mean, the Chinese just wanted to bow, uh, <laughs> and then they were like, "Okay, we can maybe maybe shake hands." Yeah, and then yeah. after like discussions, they were like, "All right, fine, you can hug us, and then you can kiss us on the cheek." But, but it that's is it. well, yeah. Luna knows more about Chinese uh, culture than me. But I think in China, you don't even, they don't even like hold hands with their spouses they, in this public. This kind right? of is something about related to Confucianism. Mm. Yeah, they try to mm. avoid uh, the kind of the body touching. They try to avoid, especially in that. public. Yeah, yeah, especially in public, and especially between men mm. and women. It's an yeah. ethics thing, yeah. right? And morality, mm. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Confucius, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just, uh, that picture of, uh, who did you say was Brezhnev, Brezhnev and Hanukkah? Hanukkah. Yeah, just to, to put that into context, yeah. that was used by the US and England and other countries as like a gay panic scare tactic against yeah. communists at the time. Like, look look at these gay, gay guys. Uh, yeah, exactly. Look yeah. at these gay guys. <laughs> Gay guys are running countries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, Soviet Union is run gay. by gay yeah. I don't know if Luna's familiar with this. I'm showing Luna the picture. Cool. So this, this is like the... It was like an old yeah. socialist thing. Wow. On the it's kind of sweet, lips? I think. Yeah. Wow. It's like it's bros a, being bros. The yeah. guy with the eyebrows is Leonid Brezhnev, the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And the other guy is Eric Konecker, who mm -hmm. was general secretary of the Socialist Unity Party in East Germany. Hmm. I like it. I think we should bring it back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's reclaim it. Well, because I mean, the, the the Soviet Union would have sent diplomats to Vietnam. So I'm just curious. Like, did they did they do it there? Because like, Luna, we've yeah. got some research projects. <laughs> the Soviets, for you. the Soviets would have <laughs> wanted to, but maybe the Vietnamese were like, no, we don't want to do that. Or <laughs> did the guys kiss or not? <laughs> yeah. Did they? I'm just, I'm interested. <laughs> I want to I wanna know. I want What's to know. What's their kissing going on? I want to know if a Soviet leader ever kissed mm. Ho Chi Minh on the mouth. <laughs> Probably not Ho Chi Minh, though, right? I saw the picture. Yeah, I saw. They, but they kiss on their cheeks. Okay. Oh. Not on their lips. Okay. And, then, and yeah, their, their cheeks. I, I remember that. Like, even until now, like, mostly all the guys, the old men in the government, they kiss in their mm. cheeks. Oh yeah, I see a picture right see? here of uh, oh, Ho Chi Minh yeah. kissing oh. a guy on the cheek. That's interesting. Yes. I wonder That's if cool. the Cubans do that. They use both. Yeah, he he used both of his hand to hold that guy's face and kiss him. <laughs> yeah, he's it's, it's like a very like like invigorate vi like a yeah. vigorous kiss. Thank you so much for sticking with us through this conversation. We hope that it's been cool. And uh, thank you so much to American for joining us. This has been a blast. Yeah. I hope we get to talk again some other time. There's still a bunch to talk about. Uh, about uh, Vietnam that we didn't get to, yeah. and yeah. Uh, it would be awesome to to talk more about uh, your views on politics and Vietnam and everything. So yeah, anytime. Yeah, I mean, chances are, if you know this channel, you know Non Compete, uh, the fun channel which does great content, leftist, Marxist, uh, libertarian, socialist, uh, whatever you want to call it, content. Uh, check it out if you haven't. If you're somehow someone who's familiar with us and not American, check out his channel. He's done some very funny, very good videos about. Uh, Marxism and leftism and the world today and uh, check out Luna too um, who uh, is uh, working with uh, American uh, doing the online videos and does great content of her own so thank you so much for joining us today and have a good day night or week or whatever thank you very much for having us thank you for listening thank you for listening we'll see you next time bye have fun bye bye <laughs>